So I'm here to talk about frameworks and how to use them without your code being held hostage. So a little bit about me. I'm the head of engineering for gradwell.com, one of the UK's largest voice over IP providers for small to medium enterprises. I co-wrote the Zen certification study guide for PHP 4. Anyone ever did anything with that? No. Nope. Well, not surprised. <laughs> And I've been contributing to open source since 1994. And there's four th themes for the talk today. First one, I want to explain what I mean by a framework holding code hostage. And I'll give some examples from Gradwell with that. And I want to take you through how you, can get a, how you can deal with that by introducing a layered architecture to your PHP applications. You don't have to ditch frameworks, you just have to change how you use them to get around the problem. And then I'm going to, one part of the layered architecture is the introduction of components. And I'm going to talk you through those and explain what makes a good component. And finally, I'll go to some examples from Gradwell about how we've introduced components and how it's helping us in our business. I've been told to ask for questions at the end rather than as we go along. But I've got some questions for the audience to get started. So can I have a show of hands? Who actually uses a framework today? Pretty much everybody. That's fantastic. Now, how many of you are developing software products rather than, rather than working for an agency doing microsites and things like that? Well, that's a lot more than I expected. That's fantastic to see. That's brilliant. Those of you who do software products should get a lot out of this talk. Those of you who are on the more creative agency side, I hope you get something out of it as well. So let's start by talking about how frameworks hold you hostage. Now stop me if you've heard this story before. Um, at Gradwell, we started off with first generation apps written in a PHP 4 style. Um, the fundamental problem with those is they are highly coupled. You can't touch the code without breaking it. After a while, the code becomes very fragile. So we had to go to a second generation app and we built our own framework for that. Excuse me. Now, the developers enjoyed building the app on top of their own framework. They, uh, they had a real passion for it until so they had to complete it or maintain the results, at which point that got a bit too much like hard work for everybody, it has to be said. Uh, how many of you have built your own frameworks here, your own in-house frameworks? And how many of you still use them? Surprising amount. But we switched to using a popular framework, or two, it has to be said. And we thought we're off, off into the stratosphere. We were really looking forward to that. And so we picked Symfony as our framework, which is um, what I talked about two years ago here. And the third generation app, very easy to extend after the steep learning curve. The steep learning curve is the main problem with bringing new staff into the company, getting them trained up on how to work with it. But there was a big problem with it. We couldn't get the code out of the third generation app to reuse elsewhere in our business. We've got apps elsewhere that aren't written in Symfony. They can't use the code that was written for the third generation app. And here's why. If you take a look at this architecture, this is you go to visit all the major framework websites and you'll find an architecture very similar to this on all of them. The idea is as a framework, you write code to plug into the framework and you can download third-party plugins contributed off the net to extend the framework as well, so you don't have to do as much work. It's pretty much the standard model across all the first-generation frameworks. But what actually happens is the framework goes and swallows your code. You write code for the framework. Your code becomes highly coupled with the framework. You can't take that code and reuse it outside of that application. There's too many hooks inside at all. And that causes a number of practical challenges, we found. So here's some questions that we've been having to answer in our business once we built our third generation of our app. How long would it take to upgrade your app to the next major version of the framework? If you use Symfony, if you use Zen Framework, this is a question that's coming up for you if you haven't had to deal with it yet. Has anyone had a go at this yet in their own business? Code Igniter. How long did it take? Um, a, week. a week. Well, that's pretty good going. 
Right. So take a lot longer with a more complex application. We see there's some major choices. Do you upgrade your framework or do you stick with the current framework, uh, version of the framework and accept that your app is going to sit there and rot? Quick show of hands. Who thinks they'd do the upgrade? It's tentative. <laughs> and who'd stick with the current version of the framework? I'd call that a dead heat. Okay. So upgrading your, upgrading your framework is going to be a commercial problem for you at some point. Now, what happens if you want to switch frameworks? This is something I'm doing at the moment. We're moving away from Symfony because we can't find uh, developers skilled in it, and we're moving to Zen Framework, which seems to have a lot of uh, people around. But what would it take to do that? Has anyone else moved frameworks? A few people? Which, which, where did you go? Uh, not really moved. The merge that, like, uh, using Coordinator before, and then merge some uh, application of Zen Framework into it. Okay. <laughs> now, were you able to port your code, or did you end up rewriting it? No, we we were able to import it. You were able yeah, to yeah. port it. Yeah. Well, that's so because good we, we had some of the issues with some other modules like ACL, uh -huh. ACL layer, or uh, using users, right? So we merged uh, Zen Framework to use ACL, and the coordinator was using the other microsites. Right. So you've ended up using both frameworks yeah. rather than switching. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Has anyone else tried switching in the past? And how well did it go for yourself? Uh, so this was at Yahoo, and uh, again, we wrote wrappers for the new framework to accept the old code framework until we could rewrite all the components. Right. Did you ever get to the actual rewriting with components? Uh, I left. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and I'm guessing from the lack of show hands elsewhere in the room, this is a problem you haven't yet had to face and you haven't had to make your decision on. Commercially, it's going to be expensive either way, you're going to find. Now, what about reusing your code? This is what started us thinking at Gradwell about this. We have more than one application for our business, and we wanted to take some of that code and reuse it elsewhere. And with Symfony, with the style of programming our developers had done, we found we couldn't, because the code had been written to rely on too many on Symfony classes. And because we were looking to move to another framework, some of the code was going to be used by apps that don't have a framework, we found that would be a massive problem for us. Has anyone else had to try this? I mean, the easy solution, if you want a cop-out, is to turn it all into a web service, an API, and do it that way. But if you want to actually take the code out, it's quite a challenge. Now, what about outsourcing? Does anyone here outsource their work? <laughs> right. If you're not, and you're based in the UK, you're missing out on a massive corporate tax uh, benefit with that. If you move work offshore outside the UK, you can pay much lower rates of corporate tax on the money earned. It's an important commercial point. And if you were outsourcing work that was being done on your app, how would you get the work delivered back to you when it's all written for the framework, it's all mashed together? It's quite hard to do. So those are the challenges we had in our business, and we decided that what we need to do is we need to change that architecture there where the framework goes and gobbles everything up. But to what? And that's the second part of my presentation. We've introduced a layered approach with our architecture. And what we've done is we've taken our original architecture. And the first thing we decided to do was we wanted to keep the framework. Frameworks have a useful purpose. But we decided what we want to do is make the app that uses the framework as thin as possible, but no thinner. So we didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What we want to do is take advantage of frameworks where they make sense. But for the rest of it, we wanted to extract out the business logic. It's got nothing to do with a framework. That's proprietary intelligence for our applications about what makes our business tick. Our data model, again, that's got nothing to do with a framework. It doesn't belong in there at all. And all the little utility libraries, all the little classes we write, just to do little things to get, job, get the job done. We've extracted all of those out, or we're in the process of doing so. So we've got an application layer and an underlying components layer. So we can change applications and suck the business logic, the data model, and the utilities into other applications if we want. To link it together, we're using a very simple autoloader, which I'll go through later on in this talk. It gives you a large set of reusable code. 
because your application should be as thin as possible. Your application should be the pages you're putting in front of your users that are unique to that particular experience you're trying to get the user to do on that particular website. If you've got multiple websites, you've got a sales website, you've got a, a more of a back office website, the experience there will be different, different applications, but the underlying business logic's the same because it's all the same company. So, if there's only one thing you take away from today, it's this. The framework app becomes a thin layer on top of framework agnostic reusable components. And the framework agnostic part is key. If your components use the framework, you're back to the old architecture where the framework's swallowing up your code. It's important to keep stuff separate. So this is the layered ar architecture. Oh, that's come out all right, actually, despite the projector. So you've got the application layer on top, the autoloader linking in to a large set of components. And when I say large, what I mean is the ratio should look more like this. You've got your application layer, your autoloader, and a growing palette of components that have already solved the job and done it well that you can just pull into your, to your apps as you need to build them. But why components? They're completely independent of the framework. So you can change a framework. It's not going to cause you any problems. They're built and tested in isolation of your application code. They are standalone units of work which allows them to be built by different teams. You can do work in parallel across offices, across countries, across time zones because you're not all working on one checkout of trunk or one rather growing convoluted set of branches. You've got isolation in a different way. The other thing about the components is because they're independent of the framework, they can change independently of the framework and the framework can be changed independently of the code as well gives you change isolation. Change is what costs businesses a lot of money. If you can isolate the cost of change and reduce it, your business is more efficient and more effective. It solves our original problem of the big ball of string syndrome from the first generation apps that were built before frameworks. You've got something that's neat and tidy. With the developers, you get a mindset change. They start thinking about their apps as part of a bigger ecosystem rather than the app as the be all and end all of life. And you're under getting an underlying rich service layer that in future you could put an API app on top of if you wished and start having your own web services. Here's a question, how many of you run web services at the minute? How many of you do it by taking your website and just making it also serve JSON or XML? A few of you, but thankfully not as many as I'd feared. That's good. Um, it's, a, it's a separate app for web services is a really good idea so you don't break backwards compatibility as you change your website. And the, this approach really helps with that. I've already mentioned development in parallel of applications and services. So if we're building an app next year, we can sit down and say, here's what the screen should look like, here's what the business needs those screens to do underneath, and I can run two teams in parallel to build those up alongside, and I can reduce the elapsed time from the start of the project to getting things out the door. We've already managed to get a project from conception to live in seven days. We've done that in the past. We want to be able to do that within a fortnight, three weeks on a regular basis. This architecture gives us that flexibility without having to bust a gut. And this isolation, this separation gives you discipline in your teams because you're not getting global variables all over the place creeping around or the session being badly abused, which ultimately is what snarls up your application. Now, in the PHP world, I'm seeing quite a few blank faces out in the audience, and when I've given this talk at the user group, there was a lot of blank faces there as well. But the PHP world is just playing catch up. Other people already do this. We are behind the curve. The, the poster child for this is Perl. How many of you have done Perl programming? A satisfying amount, excellent. So Perl's got this great big archive called CPAN, where they have CPAN modules, which is just library components like I'm talking about here. Thousands and thousands of them. You've got to, in Perl, if you need to do something, chances are someone's already written a CPAN module for it. You can go download it, test it to see if it still works, and if it does, you can focus on the little bit of glue code you need to write to make it fit into your business. We write a lot of Perl still at Gradwell because we find 
it's a very efficient way to get things done quickly because there's a large body of modules out there. Ruby. I know people say gems have the problems of their own to do with dependency hell. But Ruby and Rails and gems are a key part of their architecture of why they are able to innovate quicker than the PHP community can. So I've talked a lot about components, but I've not really explained what's inside them. So let's have a look inside components and what makes a good component. First of all, you've got to set some standards for components. They need to be common standards, something you apply across every component you build. So you've got that sense of discipline, but it allows your components to be reused by many developers in your business. If every component is completely different, designed in a different way, built in a different way, shipped in a different way, you'll spend a lot of time just sucking components in rather than actually focusing on the benefit you get by reusing them. It gives you a level of interoperability at all. In your business, if you can adopt common interfaces, common ideas, common philosophies, common patterns, if you like, it can save you a lot of time. But most important of all, the components have to be trustable. Otherwise, no one is going to reuse them. They're going to write their own instead, and you're back to reinventing the wheel, which is the last thing you want if you're trying to run an efficient business. So a good component, first of all, it auto supports auto-loading. You might think that's a given and it's, it's really obvious, but how many of you have used uh, Zeta components? Okay. It has to ship with its own autoloader because it's got its own particular layout on disk for files. It doesn't, doesn't work with other people's autoloaders. How many of you use Doctrine? Yeah. That also has to ship with its own autoloader because, again, it's got its own layout on disk. And I could pick on many, many more projects that all follow the same thing. They've all got their own standards for autoloading you don't have a consistent approach, which is a shame because other people have actually put one together, and I'll go through that shortly. Testing. Hopefully, many of you were in um, the talk that Sebastian did, um, the author of PHP Unit. Testing is such importance. So is documentation. If people have to read the source, they're wasting time. They really are. The source doesn't tell them how your code is meant to be used. It only tells them what the code actually does. The why, the intention, you can't get from source code. You can guess it, but you can't be certain. Components need to be easy, install, into, easy to install. The last thing you want to do is waste time trying to get a component to work. <coughs> Pair project. And don't break com backwards compatibility by surprise. This is a major problem with components as well. If you're upgrading a component, you want to know you can drop it in without having to change your code at all. Your code should just work when a component's got bug fixes in, it's got new features in. Now, we've said before about keeping components outside of the app and using an autoloader to pull in those components. The reason for using an autoloader is the best reason in the world to do anything, because it makes life easy. So, who's heard of PSR0? Excellent. So... There's a group of, uh, group of the leading members of the PHP community came together because the autoloader situation is not what one would wish, I think it's fair to say. And they put together a proposal for a common behavior of all autoloaders. And that's the URL for it. Do go, do go there, do have a read of it. It's a very, very good piece of work. It's backed by leading names in the company. So the Symphony guys were there, the Zen Frameworks guys were there, Jonathan from Doctrine was there, if memory serves. It's, it's got the backing of people who are, need to put this into their frameworks. And for components, it's perfectly well designed as well. Whether or not they had that in mind at the time, I don't know. I wasn't part of it, but it's a really good thing to do. And here's how it works. Namespaces. How many of you use namespaces? More of you need to upgrade then. Namespaces have a separator with the backslash. And that gets turned into PHP's directory separator um, when, when translating a class name into a file name on disk to autoload. The underscore in class names becomes a directory separator, and that's a fairly common thing most autoloaders do at the minute. The idea is that the top namespace, the first folder that the autoloader is looking inside, should be the name of your organization. My guess is they're trying to avoid Java type namespaces where it's com.callname.subdivision.blah, dot dot blah, 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 and eventually you get to the class you're actually trying to load with a very long path that you get very bored with. 
And these simple rules give you a one-to-one -one mapping from your class name to a file name on disk. It's deterministic, which is the best property of any piece of code. So here's an example. At the top there, we've got a class name from a project I was working on at the time. And the file name it turns into on disk. Very simple, very straightforward. And if we throw an underscore in, you can see how we end up with a separate directory there. Very simple rule, very easy to follow. And I've written a very simple autoloader, which you can download and use if you wish. Um, it's released under the BSD license, which implements these rules for you, so you don't have to write your own. That's autoloading. Testing. And you can't mention testing without mentioning Sebastian and PHP unit. How many of you use PHP unit? How many of you use something else? Mad fools. And how many of you don't use any unit testing at all? Oh, I hope I can convince you to change your behavior then. When it comes to testing, there's only one, there's only one unit to look at, and that's PHP unit for unit testing. It's the de facto standard for unit testing. Forget Lime, forget simple test. This is the one to use. It's supported by the leading IDEs. If those of you who use an IDE and take advantage of the features they offer, they've got PHP support, PHP unit support baked in. And the continuous integration environments, um, all the good ones support PHP unit as well. It makes your life a lot easier. And Sebastian's done a really good job with it, and it works really well with components. So use it. But what makes a good test for a component? If you were in Sebastian's talk earlier, you'd have been saying about how they, he can turn his tests into a set of documentation that describe how his code behaves. Your, your tests should document the behavior that your code is supposed to exhibit. If you write tests in that way, people should be able to read your tests and understand how to use your code, how you meant your code to be used. It's a brilliant way of doing things. Regression tests. Do any of you do regression testing? Okay. Do you all know what I mean by regression testing? Is there anyone who doesn't? Okay. So when you get a regression bug through, write a test for it. Give it the same name as the ticket you've had through so you know what, what, what problem was found and your developers can always go back and see what was going on at the time in your ticketing system and make each a test for each of those bugs you've got. Code coverage, 100%. Now, I admit, I've changed my tune on this over the years. When I started out doing software development in the 90s, this was what we were taught to do. It cost 40% of a project's budget, 100% code testing, back when we were doing C stuff in the 90s. And I thought that was too high a cost. But having come back to it with PHP unit and PHP tests, you realize that without 100% code coverage, you don't drive all the bugs out of your code. And you can ship some very surprising code, um, bugs in your code because the bits you haven't tested are your assumptions, you, where you've assumed something's going to behave a certain way. 100% code uh, coverage proves whether your assumptions are right and you'll find they're normally wrong. And you should ship your tests with a component. Perl is brilliant for this. When you install a Perl module, it actually runs the tests as part of the install, and if the tests fail, it won't let you install the module. It would be wonderful if, say, the Pear project, to pick on them again, um, actually did that. So you could download a module, run the tests, and see whether that module worked or not. If the test didn't pass, it wouldn't install, and you wouldn't end up debugging code that perhaps should not have been installed in the first place. It'd be wonderful to do that. And if you haven't got PHP unit, go get it from uh, Sebastian's website. Documentation. I imagine a lot of you are developers. How many of you like writing documentation? <laughs> But how many of you like reading documentation? That's a lot of you, but not all of you by any means. If you want something to be reused, people need to be able to learn it. And when it comes to documentation, PHP leads the way in this. PHP's manual is one of PHP's killer features. You want to learn Rails, you want to learn any of the Python stuff, you want to learn .NET. Their documentation, some of it's freely available online, not all of it is. Some of them you've got to buy dead tree books for. With PHP, anyone can go to the website, download PHP, start reading the manual, and become a PHP programmer. 
And I don't know about you, but even today I go to the PHP manual website every single day. I don't keep all of it in my head. It's my first go-to resource when I'm programming. It's a massive, massive killer feature for PHP. Your documentation should be at least as good as that. There's no reason why it can't be except that you don't want to write it. That's the only reason why it can't be that good, I promise you. Now, good documentation, first of all, it should explain how to actually load your code up and get, and get started with it. Because it's amazing how many developers forget, because they're so used to using their own code, they forget about how you initialize things. Show people how you want it used. Give some examples and don't do trivial ones. Actually give some real useful examples of how to use your code. And as people feed back to you with notes and questions, put those up there as well. Because if someone's asked a question, someone else is going to have the same question. Especially if your components get popular. The PHP manual does all of that very, very well indeed. They're all strengths of the PHP manual. Now, if I've not convinced you to write documentation, I've got four more attempts at that. Write it down so you don't have to remember how it works. You come back to your code two, three months down the road, that memory will have faded to a greater or lesser extent. If you write it down while you're creating it, you don't have to remember. Write it down so you don't have to explain it to your colleagues. It's fine if you're all sat in the same office, but if you're all working on different time zones around the world, having to be on a late night conference call to explain a piece of code you wrote to somebody who can't make it work because you never documented it, gets to be a drag. So write it down so you don't have to explain it to everyone else. You write it down once, every, you know, hundreds of developers can read that, it scales. People shouldn't have to read the source code just to get started with stuff. If they have, you really have um, failed on that score. And all of this means that other people are more likely to reuse your efforts. And we avoid the perennial problem in the PHP community of constantly reinventing the wheel, which we are all very guilty of as a community. And again, I'm going to go back to Sebastian and, um, and his website. He's used DocBook to document PHP unit and the components that are built inside that. Uh, Sebastian's framework for this is available on GitHub. Um, if you ask Sebastian, you'll find he's quite happy to let people use it. Reuse what he's already done. It works, it works really well. You can generate stuff for your iPad, if you've got one, or your Kindle. You can generate a PDF for those people who need one of those. It saves you a lot of time, and you can just focus on writing the documentation. And he's actually made DocBook look a lot revolting to, pr uh, to render on the website which in itself is a fairly good achievement, I'd say. I'm getting quite a few nods from the back there on that one. But what about PHP doc? How many of you actually use PHP documentation? A lot of you. What do you think of it? I think I heard a rubbish come out of the audience there. Um, now, PHP doc has some merit. Your IDE likes it because it's the only way it's got any clue what your parameters are meant to be. If it, uh, your IDE will use it for type hinting for auto-completion, so it's very handy for that. It's a good discipline for your developers to actually write the dot book for a method, so they summarize what the method's supposed to be. I've lost count of the amount of time I've seen a developer summarize what their method's supposed to be, and when they read the summary back, realize the method's either doing far too much work, or actually isn't solving the problem they thought it was when they started off just creating code. But PHP doc's great strength is as a reference documentation, not as a manual. It's, you can't really use it to write tutorials very well in it to get, help people understand how you want things used. But it's great if someone wants to look up a method to see what the individual method is and what its parameters are. So it does have some strengths. Packaging and installation. I've been picking on the Pear project, but I have to recommend Pear's installer as the way you actually install these components and you build them as Pear packages. It's a community-created solution. It's in widespread use already, whether you like Pear and its format or not. I'll be honest and say I think some of it needs some serious improvement, but it works. The Pear installer is found on most computers that have PHP. It used to be Pear, of course, shipped with PHP, and these days it's shipped separately. But you can get it for every version of Linux. You can put it on Windows machines, and I've heard mixed results about the quality of that. It's, it's available in a way no other tool is. You can install components 
wants to be used across the system, but it also supports support installing components into a sandbox. So each application on a server can have its own pair repository with its own set of components in, and you don't have problems of upgrading a system-wide component and breaking 10 other apps on the box at the same time. Very handy, that. And it's dead easy to publish your own pair packages and host your own pair package website. It's dead easy to do that. It's, it couldn't be easy. It really couldn't. Uh, Fabian's done a great job making that happen with what he's done for Symfony. And he's built a tool called Pyram to use that. How many of you actually host your own pair channel? Nobody. Hopefully, this talk will inspire at least one of you to do that, and that will have been a small change to the world. And if you do you set up your own pair channel, don't mess about, just, set, just get Pyram, slap it on a box, you're up and running, got your own pair channel in five minutes. You craft one XML file to edit, you run one command, and it's done. It couldn't be easier. Now, we've got a, our own pair channel where we're slowly laying out some open source stuff for what we do at work. There isn't much up there at the minute, there will be more over the coming months and years. And if you point a browser at the web, at a pair pack channel set up by Pyram, this is the sort of screen you'll see. And for actually making components, I've knocked up a little command line utility called Fix, which will create the skeleton of a component for you, so you can just put your code in there, your unit tests in there, and it will generate pair packages for you as well. And that's available via GitHub. And I'll be blogging about that um, over the weekend as well. Now, backwards compatibility, this is very important because when people use components, they feel like they're walking on eggshells, that things are going to break outside of their control. So backwards compatibility with components is a key thing to solve. Why does it matter? You've got to isolate your component to reduce the effect of change. That's the whole point of creating a component. You've got a small piece of code isn't affected by everything else going on around it as, as the world changes. So you're trying to reduce your costs from a business point of view, and as a developer's point of view, you want to write the code and move on to something else. You don't have to keep coming back to it. But the moment you break backwards compatibility, that cost is gone. That, sorry, that benefit is gone and has turned into a cost. You upgrade a... Let's pick on a pair package. How many of you upgraded pair packages and found your app stopped working? <laughs> yes, I've had that experience as well. And it's unnecessary. You don't need to do it. And the more components you use in an app, or the more apps you use your components, the cost scales negatively. It's really bad. It's something to really avoid. But it's easy to solve just by doing a very simple versioning scheme. How many, uh, how many of you actually put version numbers on your code? Less than half, about a quarter, say? In the old days, we used to call every, we used to say X, Y, Z as the numbering scheme. This has been around for decades, where X is the major version, but it's also your API version, or your, if you're working in C, your ABI version, your binary interface version. One point X is your promise to customers that you're not going to break the backwards compatibility. Add new features, you increment the second number. So 1.1 has new features, but it's backwards compatible with 1.0. 1.2 has new features. It's backwards compatible with both 1.1 and 1.0. And then we use the third number for bug fixes. So you've not added new features, you've just fixed something you've broken. You can show users that by changing the version number on your next release. Now, backwards compatibility, you have to break that sometimes for innovation, to move things forward. Otherwise, we'd all still be using PHP 1, which I, I, I never use, but I can't imagine it'd be much fun. Just don't do it by surprise. By changing the X number, you warn people that you've broken backwards compatibility and they can choose whether to go to version 10 from version 9 or stick with version 9. You give them the choice. They can make an informed decision. You're not surprising them. You're not ambushing them. Don't be afraid to bump that number, that first number up at all. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Don't say, oh, we've got to go from version 2 to version 3. Don't let that be a reason to stop you innovating. Because Google Chrome's already on version 10, and that's worked out pretty well for them so far. I think we'd all agree, yes? Okay? The days when version numbers are controlled tightly by marketing companies, thankfully, seem to be over, at least for the moment. Sadly, what goes around comes around, and it'll come back, I know. But for the moment, 
version, version numbers seem to be back in the hands of developers. So to recap about components, good components autoload, PSR zero, well tested, PHP unit, unit tests. They're well documented, write it down so other people can read it without having to ask you. They're easy to install, create pair packages, use Pyram to host your own pair channel and use transparent version numbers so you don't break backwards compatibility by surprise. If you follow those guidelines, you'll get the benefits of components without the costs of doing it badly. And there we go. Those of you who read the slides online later, just a reminder there about that. So I want to show you an example, just to finish, of why components are helping us in our business. An actual concrete example. And some of my staff and ex-staff are in the audience, so feel free to heckle. I'm used to it. Okay, so here's an example. Now, for our website, we sell broadband products. So we've got a sales website where we've got a sales pitch, we've got the product specs, and an availability checker. Can you get our broadband? What speed will it be? The usual thing. But we've also got a control panel for customers once they've signed up, where they, uh, they can manage their account, they can read their invoices and hopefully pay them. That'd be nice. And we also have the availability checker on there because broadband isn't all we sell and the control panel is a place we can put new products in front of customers to, to cross-sell, to get them to buy an additional product from us. So we need the same functionality in both places. Now at the minute, the sales website gets that functionality from the control panel. We just inject an iframe into the sales website to do this. It has the advantage that it gives the same experience on both websites. And our control panel then has the code that talks via SOAP um, to the third party who actually provides our broadband. Because we, we resell Opal and Tiscali's broadband products. We don't actually manage all the cabling, etc. ourselves. So that's an architecture. It works. You can make money off it. But it does come with a problem. We wanted to change our third party and sell some different broadband products. But there's some, a lot of innovation going on in broadband, um, and we needed to change companies to do that, which means changing the provisioning system, changing the fault reporting, and changing the availability checker. Now, hopefully you can see already on the diagram the problem this causes. We didn't want to change the control panel at the time to support the, the new third party products because it's got its own roadmap but we did want to get it into the sales website. Um, and so we, we, we were forced with the idea of changing our control panel even though we didn't want to with our current architecture. We, we needed to change that because we want to actually retire that control panel. I've got a team of people at the minute writing a replacement. So I, want to, I don't want to spend more money on dead code. I want to be able to switch this, this thing off later this year. And if I'm writing new code for it, I'm never going to switch it off. So here is an architectural problem. So what we did is we took the code that talks to the third party's availability checker and we separated it out into a component, standalone, reusable piece of code. Now that, that one simple act solved our architectural problem. The sales website can now use the new component and it can talk directly to the third party. It doesn't have to go through the control panel at all. I can switch off my con the control panel when the new version's ready. And when the new version's ready, it will also be able to reuse that new availability checker. Gives us a lot of flexibility just with a very small change. The majority of the code that we've extracted out is the same as it used to be. We've just removed some of the symphony dependencies it used to have. But by making it a standalone unit of code that we can then drop into multiple applications, we freed up our log jams and our roadmaps so that the sales website can move at its own pace and our control panel can move at its own pace. And we're doing this now across the rest of our applications because the customers we sell to has changed over the last 12 years. And as a result of that, our old applications are no longer fit for purpose. They work, they support a, a, a particular user base, but our new users, they need a different experience. So we're taking all the logic, because our business hasn't changed, it's our user base that's changed and the scale we're working at has changed. So we're taking all that logic out and we're refactoring it bit by bit into components. And that's going to allow the sales team and the engineering team 
to move at their own speed without any major log jams. Sales, sales don't have to wait for engineering to change engineering's products in order for sales to then change how they're selling those products. Sales can write new sales wizards, um, they can do special offers, etc., because they can talk directly to the third party. They're not dependent on us updating the control panel to match. And it also allows us to take features that currently aren't shared across our different parts of the business and start to share them. So we, our customers start to get a better experience, a more integrated spirit, experience, and that's what we're working towards. And that's going to take us probably about 18 months to two years to achieve. We're across four main business areas. I'm now many age. Do you remember how many lines of code we're talking about? Tens of thousands. I haven't looked in a long time. It's going to take us about two years to do this, but it gives our business the ability to move at a better speed once it's done, much more flexibility, much less friction inside the business as well, which is another important reason to do it. And our customers will get better experience out of it because things will work the same um, or at least not have, at least they will not have their own unique bugs across our different parts of the business. So that's what I've got to say about going beyond frameworks and avoiding your code being held hostage. But I, I want to know from the audience, how many of you have tried this approach yourselves? Excellent. And how have you got on with it? Because we've just started down this road. It makes a lot of sense to us. Um, every benefit, everything we've done with it has been positive. But how have you got on? It's gone well, has it? What, have you run into any problems I've not described in this talk at all? Um, not really. I separated myself a couple of years ago, and so far it's going, it's going all right. Excellent. How about anybody else? Anyone else got to add on this? Stunned oh, silence. Chains up. Jeremy at the back. It's just a question, really. Um, sure. How have you found it's affected the uh, percentage of the effort of the project to adopt this model and also the um, focus and speed that you can actually deliver at? It has accelerated it. I can't give you an exact percentage, but what we found is our the contractors we've been using this year have actually found it easier to work in this manner than trying to uh, um, extend our existing code. Um, give them a problem to solve, say do it in isolation, it's something they can easily do, they get a sense of completion from ticking it off, it's done, they can move on. And they're happier, they're more productive as a result of that, and we're getting code through. Um, I had one contractor who was trying to up, was actually, we actually did pay someone to try and update our control panel to support the new availability checker. He got the availability checker working, did a great job with that, well tested, shoehorning into the old legacy application, we gave up in the end, it was costing too much. It probably cost more to try to shoe, shoehorn it in than it did to create the standalone component and give that to sales to reuse. Any more questions? Uh, right, works for him. Okay, um, I just want to know what the interface for these components looks like. I mean, what do they pass back and forth? Are they well, they're just, just libraries of objects at the end of the day, and therefore, that, so that you're passing classes backwards and forwards. You can do it with procedural code. You can write just PHP 4 style functions if you choose. I would recommend not doing that purely for the autoloading benefits but you can do that. But perhaps the easiest way to do that, were especially this projector's just rubbish, I'm afraid. Grab me afterwards, I'll pull up some components and show you. Uh, Might yeah. be easier. Okay, thanks. All right. Back here. I was wondering if you were at the uh, Zero MQ talk this morning and could you use that sort of idea to feed in your components? I'm sorry, I wasn't at the talk. Okay. Um, but your components could be interfaces to something like zero MQ. You could use components to hide the fact you've got zero MQ in your business. So that if you ever wanted to replace it with another queuing system or an alternative approach, you want to say go for message passage rather than a queuing system, you could do that. And all that changes is the component 
that the rest of your code is consuming. And so long as you can maintain your components compatibility outwards to your apps, you can make architectural changes much quicker. We had another question over here. There you go, sir. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a similar sort of question about service-oriented architecture and web services. Uh -huh. How do you use that, and what would you think of using that to get to some of the components? This approach is fully compatible with a service-oriented architecture because you can take those components and then you can put a, an app, an, a, a service layer on top. Um, you can expose them via a queuing system, via Gearman, or via REST or SOAP-based, if you must, API. Um, and by refactoring your app into components first, you're not going for a big bang web service approach. You're taking, you're taking functionality that works, isolating it, making sure it's well tested, using it in your app quickly so you're getting the benefits back to the business so they're willing to fund more of this work because that's a crucial thing as well. Someone's got to pay for this work at the end of the day. And then in time, you can then take your app and put another app beside it to be the web service layer. You can give that to your customers. You could make your front-end apps then sit on top of that layer if you wished. It all works really well with that. And hopefully in two years' time, I'm hoping to come back and tell you how well it's gone for us. Hiya, sorry. Um, what, so what are you actually using the framework for now? Are you just using it for a router or to use models and views and controllers provided by the framework? Or? We are using views and controllers. The models we're using, we're moving to Doctrine for that but we're moving the doctrine um, as a component in its own right because our database scheme is shared by multiple applications, both front office and back office. So we're using the framework for the VC capabilities, but the M, we, we're using doctrine as a separate layer. Okay. And do you, uh, do you ever run in, into any dependency problems? Now, uh, I think you, uh, you said a lot about pair was causing you problems with that. In, in if you've extracted so much out into myriads of components, do you ever have any problems with those components not? At this early stage, we've, we're, we're about four or five months into this sort of work. We've got a long way to go yet. We've not yet run into problems. The whole point of the transparent versions is to try and make sure that doesn't happen. Sooner or later, a developer is going to accidentally break backwards compatibility. It, life's just not perfect. But if you're, um, the way you spot that is to see if anyone's changing your unit tests. If your unit test has to change rather than you add additional tests, that's often a smell that you've broken backwards compatibility. And you need to look at that and see whether that test change is legitimate or whether you're actually just broken your component. It's the best way to pick that up. Any more questions? Down the side there. Hello. Um, you talk about using pair to manage components. Uh -huh. um, what do you feel about using Pair as a library? Because you could have a Zen framework yep. and have exactly the same or very similar component. <coughs> Whereas if it's in Zen, it's less portable. But if, if you've got Pair, potentially that could be reused in a, in a different framework and you could still use the, the, the Pair component. My personal experience with Pair is take each component on its own merits. Some of them are excellent. Some of them were excellent and have rotted over time. Some of them are not yet at that excellent standard. Test each one individually. If it works for you and the license is compatible with your software, use it. Thanks. Any more questions? So, I've got one question for you to finish then. How many of you think that you might go back and start working in a more component way forward? Wow. Wow. That's excellent. How many of you actually are able to make that decision yourselves? A surprising amount. How many of you have got to sell it to your boss? Okay. If you need help selling it to your boss, give him my details. <laughs> I am the head of engineering for one of the UK's fastest growing tech companies for the last two years. I can talk his language if, you, if he won't talk to you about this stuff. I'm quite happy to help you pitch that. Okay? That's a genuine offer. Do take me up on it. I don't mind. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience.